to stop the spread of coronavirus. So let's get tested and get back to the things we love. Hello, good afternoon. I'm John Mayer. Welcome to My Virtual Jericho, which happens every Wednesday afternoon. Today, we've got a rather special My Virtual Jericho. Uh, my fellow Jericho resident, Professor Richard Petto, um, the Professor of Medical Statistics at Oxford University, talking about the number of COVID deaths. Uh, I know nothing about this, so I, like you, are looking forward to what Richard is going to say. Over to you, Richard. Okay, thanks. You can hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay, good. Um, well, there's lots of different estimates of the number of COVID deaths, and that's particularly because back in March and April, when the epidemic was getting going, we didn't have widespread testing. And so a number of people who were basically dying from something else could get COVID on top of whatever else they'd got, and they'd finish up dying a bit sooner than they would otherwise have done. But a lot of people who were old and who were dying anyway, it was actually COVID that finished them off. Now, this sort of thing has happened for a long time with infectious diseases. My mother had in heart failure, and she had about 10 years of heart failure and she's had quite a good quality of life from the neck upwards, but from the neck downwards, it was a disaster. But then what she finally died of, finally she got pneumonia on top of it. And it was really, that was why she died. It was, it was the heart failure that was really the underlying cause of death, but she just got pneumonia on the top of it and died within about 24 hours. And all it said on the death certificate was pneumonia. It didn't mention the heart failure. And quite a lot of the deaths from COVID back in March, April, what was happening was that people who were dying of other things anyway, maybe dying from with dementia, maybe dying after being seriously paralyzed by a stroke or you know late stage Parkinson's disease or something like that, or even dying from terminal cancer, um, they could get COVID on top of it. And that was the thing that finished them off. But early on, this wouldn't be known. So all that you get on the death certificate was what the underlying cause of death was without mentioning the fact that it was COVID that had finished them off. So COVID should have been mentioned, but the underlying cause of death really was the disease that was sort of prostrating them in the first place. And this has caused quite a lot of confusion as to how many deaths from COVID there have been in this country, because there were a number of deaths where COVID actually finished off somebody who was on the edge of dying anyway, and the COVID itself never got noticed because the patient was in such a bad state, and so the death certificate never mentioned it. But it shows up when you start comparing, say, number of deaths in March, April 2020 with the numbers of deaths in March, April, say, the year before or in the five years before, because these deaths are brought forward from when they would have happened. So we get a big spike in March, April and early May, which in a way represents um, deaths brought forward, but not brought forward very far. In addition to that, there would some, there'd be some deaths from COVID that got missed, some deaths of people who are sort of otherwise healthy who died of COVID, but that was much less likely to be missed than deaths of people who are dying of something else anyway. So what I'm gonna do is show you a few graphs, um, just take you through them, and then do a little bit of to and fro with John Mayer. He keeps on calling me Petto, but I don't mind. My name is Peter, but he doesn't believe me. Okay, so share screen. Now, these graphs have been prepared by Professor Valerie Burrell, who works in Oxford and has been trying to make sense of the national statistics. So I want to just acknowledge her as being the source of the graphs I'm going to show. Um, John, could you just nod if you can see that graph? Can you see it? 
Good, thank you. OK, now this shows just the number of deaths per week. These are the number of weekly deaths um, from March to July in the United Kingdom. And what it's doing is comparing what happened in 2020 versus the average of what happened in 2015 to 19. And you know, you'd think by 2020, we ought to have been doing slightly better than 2015 to 19, slightly better, but you know, it should have been roughly comparable. But instead, it, these white squares and circles are showing what happens, the sort of average for 2015 to 19. You can see the, death, the number of deaths going down slightly as we move from sort of late winter through spring and into summer. You know, you get slightly lower death rates in summertime always in this country. You get more deaths in the winter and fewer deaths in the summer. That's just normal in Britain. It's normal in all, um, in all latitudes like ours. So you can see a slight drifting downwards in the white symbols. But then you can see how suddenly the black ones with the 2020, suddenly in mid-March, when the second half of March, they go shooting up. So there's the third week of March. There's the fourth week of March. And there's early April. And incidentally, one problem we have with death registration in Britain is that when you get bank holidays, this delays death registration. So if you've got a time when there's a bank holiday, then you've got to take a week where there's a bank holiday, then a death which would have been registered when the, when the registry offices were close to the bank holiday might get registered a week or two later. So where there's a bank holiday, wherever there's a bank holiday, we add up, we take the average of that week and the two weeks after it. So, and we plot that as a square. So each circle represents one week. So that's the week, a particular week, that's a particular week, that's a particular week. And there's the average for three weeks, spanning the Easter, uh, the Easter bank holidays. Then there's one week here. Then there's another average of three weeks because you've got the early May bank holiday. And then there's another three week period because you've got the late May bank holiday. No, I just went on to three weeks anyway, because by then things are quietened down. But you can see the, this spike of, you know, we were getting 23,000 deaths a week, but it should have been more like about, you know, 12,000 12, deaths a week. And that excess, you can sort of work out roughly how many deaths were had COVID as a cause by comparing 2020 versus the previous five, the average for the previous five years. Um, and th that's the difference between these two graphs. And that corresponds to a total of about 70,000 deaths. Now, there are various other measures which say, you know, some of the statistics that come from the government say 40 something thousand deaths, some others from the government say about 50 something thousand deaths. And this number suggests about 70,000 deaths. And the big reason for this difference are these deaths where the person was dying anyway of something else and where. COVID was the thing that just finished them off, but especially back here, back in the second half of March, testing just wasn't available. We've just had a video screened saying, get yourself tested, get yourself tested. Well, if it had been early April, late March, early April, he couldn't have, because the testing wasn't set up, wasn't working. And even people who were in hospital and ill might not get tested. It might not be realized because they're so ill from something else, they're dying from something else. It might not be realized that it was actually COVID that just actually finished them off. And so one effect of this is that the people who were dying are gone. They, they died back in late March, April, maybe a little bit early May and so on. And so by the time you get to June, although there's still COVID deaths, we're finishing up with a number of deaths being lower than the average. And this is because those who would have been dying in June, July, actually died back here in March, April. So the deaths got brought forward a bit. And so this historical comparison, the comparison of the previous few years is quite good for saying how many deaths of how many deaths was COVID a cause, but you know, you can't really use it for that purpose in June and July. Otherwise we'd say there weren't any deaths in June and July from COVID and there were. So, and, and, but on the other hand, in a sense, it's saying how many deaths would there have been in total over this period where well, it's not bad for that. Um, so it, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a funny one. Um, okay, now that's a historical comparison. Now you can do it in another way because these deaths where they were actually dying from something else, they often wouldn't have COVID written on the death certificate. And so we can look and see how many deaths were there where COVID was mentioned on the death certificate and how many deaths were there where it wasn't mentioned on the death certificate. And here 
we've got the similar graph. This is now just the 2020 mortality, nothing to do with 2015 to 19 anymore, just 2020. So here, here we got the 56,000 deaths with COVID mentioned on the death certificate. And here we've got the deaths where COVID wasn't mentioned. But look, suddenly we get a big jump up in the deaths where COVID wasn't mentioned. Why is that? Well, it's because people were dying then, they were dying of something else. COVID was what did, finally did them in. And so the deaths, the deaths come here rather than later on. And you can see how many of these deaths there were. In a way, there are deaths where COVID should have been mentioned, but where you know one should also have said that something else was the underlying cause of death, like my mother's death. And that's the excess with COVID not mentioned on the death certificate. And mostly these are deaths of old people. I mean, John is 70, I'm 77. So, you know, we know that people over 70 matter. But actually, of these 18,000 18, deaths, 16,000 of them were people who are over 70. Most of them were people who are over 80. And many, and the majority of them, I think, would have been really seriously ill with something else. What was the excess? What was this excess put down to? What, what were the certified causes? Well, dementia, death in, a, death in a care home from dementia, death in a care home from stroke. That's what it was said to be. So... You know, when people were in care homes dying, if COVID got into the care home, then that might be what finished people off. But it was the ones where they were actually plausibly dying of something else, where the COVID got missed completely. So here, this would suggest that over this period, up to July, there'd be about 74,000 deaths where COVID was a cause. But in a way, the death of somebody who is dying anyway isn't the same as the death of somebody who's got a reasonable quality of life. And I don't know how to mix these together, but the number of deaths where COVID was a cause of what finally happened, it's a, it's a somewhat misleading statistic. I mean, not completely misleading, it's a true fact, but you know, it's, it's not the same. You know, somebody dying at age 50, where they were at age 60, 70, where they've got a good quality of life and could have expected to enjoy many more years compared with somebody who's got a you know, really bad quality of life and is dying anyway. Okay. So this is so that that's two ways, two sorts of comparisons. One is comparing with the previous five years, and one is comparing 2020 with itself and just drawing a straight line from what happened in March down to what was happening at the end of May and saying, look, that excess, particularly in March and April, you see these these three points here span the whole of span late March and the whole of April. That um, this excess here is, it stands out as being something to do with the COVID epidemic, and that's what it is. It, it, in a sense, it's COVID was the death, was the cause, was a cause, but it wasn't the underlying cause of the death. Okay, now where did these deaths happen? And the answer is predominantly in care homes. So the other thing you can do is take the epidemic and look at the number of weekly deaths that took place in a care home and elsewhere. Now, if we take the adult population of this country, say the over 30s, there's 40 million people who are over the age of 30, and 0.4 million of them, 1%, were living in a care home. And yet, a lot of the deaths, here are the COVID deaths on the left, deaths with COVID on the death certificate, and you can see the number of deaths not at a care home, that's basically nearly all of them were in hospital, number of deaths in a care home, and the, so you see a big proportion were in a care home, and actually it's even bigger than that, because if you look carefully, you find out that a lot of these deaths in hospital, the deaths not in a care home, COVID deaths not in a care home, when you look at it, you find that the person was actually living in a care home, they'd got ill, and they'd been taken to hospital because they were ill, so these were care home residents who'd got ill, and were then taken to hospital. Because they were in hospital, they, they picked up the COVID and the COVID went on the death certificate. So if you did death of somebody living in a care home and deaths of somebody not living in a care home, then actually it would be half of all the COVID deaths. It looks like there's more deaths not in a care home than in a care home, that's true. But if you took death of people who were living in a care home, it would be half and half. And if you then take, what about the deaths that got missed? It's even more extreme. Because over on the right, we've got the deaths that got missed. So these are the deaths where COVID wasn't mentioned on the death certificate. And you can see the, the, the bottom line here is deaths in a care home, deaths from deaths in a care home where COVID wasn't mentioned because it wasn't noticed. And here we've got deaths not in a care home where COVID wasn't mentioned. And these 
first couple of points here would be mainly deaths in hospital in the in late March, early April, when even the hospitals didn't have tests. So these would be deaths in hospital, and some of those would be deaths of care home residents, but mostly not. So it's, it's a sort of under-certification of deaths in hospital, but again, nearly all in the over 70s or over 80s. And then most of the excess is deaths in the care home. So if you added these deaths in the care home, this excess, to the ones over here, to the ones with COVID on it, it'd be more like 60% of the deaths where COVID was a cause were actually deaths of people living in care homes. I'm not saying that people living in care homes don't matter. But it, it, I think if we want to understand the epidemic, then the, the crude total number is in some ways a, a bit misleading. This is the only complicated slide I'm going to show. If you thought the other ones were complicated, then you're wrong. This is the only complicated one. After these, it gets much, much simpler. So, OK, I said we got, had 74,000 deaths. That's up to late July. But if we take it up to early September, we've had about 75,000. Whereas various two different sources of government numbers are giving 50-something thousand or 40-something thousand. That's because they're not including these 18,000 where COVID wasn't mentioned anywhere on the death certificate. The historical comparison comparing to 2015 to 19 picks them up. But if you just look at the death certificate, you, you'd miss them completely. But look, of these 75,000 deaths, 50,000 were of people who are over 80, again, mostly in care homes. Another 15,000 were people who were in their 70s, like me, I'm 77. And 8,000 were people in later middle age. You, you, know, you really shouldn't have people dying at ages 50 to 69. It really shouldn't happen. And 1,000 were aged 5 to 49. But actually, nearly all of them were... 30 to 49, with almost no deaths before age 30. Some, but almost none. And you sort of start comparing that to the number of millions of populations and you, you find the what proportion have died of COVID over the last, um, over the last six months, <coughs> the last five months. And well, you know, for older people, it's 1.5%. For people in their 70s, it's 0.3%. And for people in middle age, it's very much smaller. I mean, overall, it's 0.1%, something like that. 75,000 out of 66 million. So those, those are the numbers. And this has, been, this has been the main source of the confusion. These 18,000 where they died, they were dying of something else. And it was the something else that put down, got put down on the death certificate as the underlying cause because the COVID wasn't noticed. And as I say, the main, the main thing is death. these were deaths from dementia, from stroke, from late stage Parkinson's disease, late stage cancer, things where, you know, they were, the people were dying anyway. Um, the other source of confusion I'll mention here, um, this number is, says 57,000, which I think is correct. And this is the number who died with COVID mentioned on the death certificate. Now, probably, if you died over the last few months with COVID mentioned on the death certificate, then COVID would have been a cause of your death. Um, but some of the government statistics have been, had you tested positive for COVID? And so if you demand not only that the doctor mentioned COVID, but also that there'd been a proper COVID test, then this misses some of the deaths back in March, April, early May. So there's about another 10,000 deaths there where COVID, where although the doctor put down COVID when writing the death certificate out, there hadn't actually been a COVID test, so it was just the doctor's informed opinion, but it was probably correct. So there are two sources of confusion. First, you can have COVID mentioned but not confirmed as positive. Second, you could have a death where they were dying of something else and COVID, got, COVID didn't get mentioned at all. And so this shows why we've got such a range from 75,000, where COVID was a cause of the death, down to, well, I mean, I think 57,000 is, is probably the best one, if you want to say, was it, you know, was one of the, of the government numbers. OK, so um, briefly, I think we've had 75,000 deaths, that 57,000 where the death certificate didn't mention COVID, about 18,000 where it didn't mention COVID. Um, and where I've just said, I think that COVID was a cause, judging by those striking, strikingly irregular trends where suddenly things shoot up. But 
The main comment I'd make that the number of deaths with COVID as a cause is a very unsatisfactory statistic if we want to describe the seriousness of the epidemic. You know, it, because it includes many people already very old or seriously moribund. And if, but if we're going to be talking about the total number, I'd like people to just estimate it correctly. And at the moment, they're not doing so. I don't think that a good newspaper headline summarizing what I think, I do not think that saying true number of deaths is from COVID is 75,000. I don't think that would be an appropriate summary. And also, the other thing is, when you look at where these deaths were happening, there were concerns that this excess of deaths with COVID not mentioned meant that the hospital services were failing us in the treatment of other diseases. And I think that that is a completely wrong conclusion. I don't think we've got any material increase in mortality due to the failure of the health service to cope with other diseases. I'm not saying nobody died as a result of the failure of health services to cope with other, but there were fears that there might have been a lot of extra deaths from things like heart attacks or asthma or, you know, things where the health service really ought to step in and act urgently. So there were a lot of fears of that in March and April when people realised that the weekly numbers of deaths were way above the historical average. And I think those fears are completely misplaced. It's, it's, um, it's, the, it's an excess of deaths of old people, and the predominant excess is actually of deaths which got certified as being due to dementia. So in a way, it's good news that the health service didn't fail. And, well, it's, it, it's, it's a, it, I don't know how to pitch this story. I mean, there is some curious sense in which there, there was a, there's a very strange phrase that I'm sure we've all heard, of describing pneumonia as being the old man's friend. And when I first heard that, when I was young, I was completely shocked by it. And at some level, at some level, there's something, there's something there, but this really is going beyond the statistics and getting into what do we actually want and what do we think of it? What do we think about humanity and morality and all sorts of things? So I'll stop with the statistics. So thank you, John. Uh, uh, Richard, the government says there's 42,000 deaths. Right yes. well. well, that's that's the, that's the question of test positive, and they've also changed it. You've got to have tested positive within the last 28 days. So th that 42,000 is too low. If you look at the Office of National Statistics estimate, they'd say by now 57,000. I mean, their last statistics were up to August the 26th of um, August the 21st, at which point they're saying something from like 56,000 or something. But that's that's 56,000 with COVID mentioned. So government comes up with two numbers. One is the one that you just quoted, 42,000 something, which if you update it a little bit would take you to 43,000. But the other, but the, so that's one statistic that you get from the government. And that's the one that goes on the TV and in the newspapers. But the Office of National Statistics has always preferred to say, to use the statistic, was COVID mentioned on the death certificate? So, so why are they related to the difference figure? between these two on many occasions? I mean, it's been pointed out many times by the Office of National Statistics. Why do they persist with this 42,000 figure? Switch, um, in the middle of February, when they suddenly switched to saying we don't have to have um, COVID tested and confirmed, it suffices that the doctor thought it was COVID. And there was a sudden jump in the number of Chinese deaths attributed to COVID, but it was just a change in the rules from requiring a test into not requiring a test. So, Richard, are they massaging the figures to get forty-two thousand? Um, I don't think. I don't think it's necessarily massaging. I mean, they really didn't know what was going on in when they in April, and you know what, what what was going on. And when you get testing, you, what they required when they first came up in April was tested positive and died. And so that was what they started with. And that was too low because a lot of people were dying without testing positive. And so a lot of the death certificates that were being written then mentioned COVID, but the doctor who did the death certificate couldn't prove it. So you've got a choice between three different numbers. And I think, I think that, I th and I think the difference between the, well, the statistic, which is in the 40s, um, and the, the 56,000, 57,000, I mean, that's been clear and it's been discussed a lot of times by the Office of National Statistics. So the difference is, was, did you test positive for COVID? Did the doctor who certified your death mention COVID? And then the last one, which is the one I'm putting up, which is, was COVID 
a cause of your death, even if the doctor who certified the death didn't know of it. Perhaps you stop sharing your screen so we can actually... Okay, uh, stop uh, sharing. So, so from what you're saying, the, the truer figure is close to 56, 57,000, correct? No, no. I, I think, yeah, I think, I think probably... No, that's, that's the number where COVID was mentioned. If you say 75,000, perhaps, you know, even if you are dying from, you know, you're lying there paralyzed with a stroke and you basically, you're going to do nothing except lie there paralyzed until you die. Um, and then if you then get COVID, then that'll be what takes you off. But it wasn't COVID, then basically sooner or later pneumonia is going to do it. Um, and or if you, you're lying there dying of terminal cancer and you know, it might be COVID that sort of finally takes you off. Um, should, you put down that, should you put that down as a death from COVID? And I think, I think, I don't, I don't think, I've, I don't know how best to describe this. In a way, I'd like to take people who have actually got a reasonably good quality of life and where they're not particularly going to die in the near future, um, and there, well, there's no particular reason to expect them to die in the near future above, except their age, and then ask how many of them actually died of COVID, you know, died unexpectedly of COVID where they weren't particularly expected to die of something else. I mean, that I think would be the preferable statistic, but we don't have it. But look, look, looking back, Richard, at your figures, but, we've sacrificed tens of thousands of old people, most of them in care homes. And we, uh, well, what do you mean to sacrifice them? It's not sacrifice them. I mean, it's, it's um, I think that if you've got, I mean, you, you've got lower death rates now than the historical average, or at least you did in um, June, and Ju June and July, because the people who would have died in June and July had died in April. I don't, I don't think that that's best described as sacrificing tens of thousands of old people. Well, was it wise to send old people out of hospital back into care homes? You mean, the, should people have actually realised that I mean, any sort of institution, but particularly with a disease like this, which gets twice as common when they're five years older. So if you get five years older, it's twice as common. If you're 10, 10 years older, it's four times as common. Then it's going to be, it's going to be particularly um, bad if it gets into institutions. If it, I think that should have been foreseen earlier, the sort of hazard of care homes, but they were just, you know, they just, they were just being hit by a tidal, tidal wave. I wouldn't put that down to malice particularly. Um, it's, you know, I don't think that the care homes epidemic was sufficiently clearly foreseen. Now, WHO is and, and you really a lot of workers consultant. more care to keep care homes clean. Yeah. WHO said that in March, we should be testing, testing, testing. And we gave it up uh, until until we took it took up again in in June or July. Was was that a wise decision? Look, I'm not going to get in what was wise or not wise on the part of the government. What I'd like to do is to get the statistics straight. You've written books saying that this was a wise and it's sacrificing tens of thousands. So that's fine, but I just want to try and get the, the numbers straight. And it's <laughs> difficult to do so because because of the the enormous tendency of it to kill those who've already got something wrong with them. The, the more ill you are, the greater risk of, the greater your risk of death from COVID. Now, now the trends are, it, because there's a lot of testing, down, down, down. I mean, yesterday, how many, uh, day before yesterday, five people died, but many more oh, people- Oh no, it's more been... than that per day. I mean, it's, it's it, we're running up to more than 20 a day in the UK still. I mean, it's, it's about, you know, probably about 150 a week, 160 a week, and it, we're probably at a minimum now, and it's likely to rise from now. So it's, you know, we, we've gone down, we've gone down from, you know, nearly 10,000 a week, down to about 100, well, 150, 160 a week. And this is probably around about the minimum it's going to get. I mean, from now on, it's likely to start to go up again, as it has in Spain, catastrophically. How will you tell when a, if a second wave is coming? Well, it's difficult because the more you test, the more you see. And so the number of cases is going to go up in ways that don't necessarily reflect the, the way the epidemic goes. So the more you, you've got the problem with the more you test, the more you see. I think the statistic I would trust most as an indicator 
is the number of deaths with COVID mentioned. And also since late May, that really basically if COVID was a cause, then this would be this would be mentioned because everybody in care homes, the, the order went out on about the 28th of April that everybody in a care home, no matter how ill they were, should be tested and so should everybody working in a care home. And that was done in late April and the first half of May. And so everybody actually, um, everybody would know. So, so, what, what's the indicator that would tell us that we're on the crest of a, of a second wave and when we, you're not a, you're a statistician, not, not, not a fortune teller, when will, when will, when will that come? Well, I, I think, you know, we could have avoided more than half the cases if we'd managed to keep it out of care homes last time around. So it may be that we, we've got more idea of what the enemy looks like now. Um, and so we may be able to to limit it. I, I, I really don't know. I mean, we don't have a vaccine yet. We've got one drug that's been shown to save lives, which is dexamethasone. Um, none of the antivirals have really been shown to save lives, unfortunately. Maybe the new ones that are coming will. I mean, there's, there's the obvious hope is that the monoclonals, which are going to become which are going into clinical trials in well, maybe this month or but certainly next month. I mean, they may well be quite good at saving lives, maybe. And so, so maybe we'll be able to manage it. We do, we, we're more aware of what the real situation is now. We're, we're more aware of what the enemy is like now. So the medicines got better, the treatments got better in the last five months. Well, the medicines hasn't got much better yet, but I mean, we've got dexamethasone if you're really in the late stages, but you know, it, it's still, I mean, if you are in the late stages, it's still quite hazardous. But it, you, we do have a medicine that works, which is, you know, which is better. And we may have a vaccine that works, or has been shown to work at, at some stage this year. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe next month, maybe possibly even this month, I don't know. But maybe not. I, I think we I think we're going to get a claim from America well before the November the third election that they've got a vaccine that works, but it would be about as reliable as Putin's claim, probably. And, and, but, uh, your, your piece in the Lancet, your article in the Lancet said that the vaccine that didn't work was as bad as anything. Well, I think that if you got wide deployment of a vaccine which was in fact not of much value, then I think it would get in the way of trying to evaluate better vaccines and it would also get in the way of trying to take other measures, other control measures. So I think it could do harm it could actually do harm rather than just being neutral. It could actually do harm. Yes, you've done that's a, what we wrote, yeah. and I think I think that is true. The argue, we were arguing that if you're going to, if we try to vaccinate a billion people, then we really need serious evidence that the vaccine is is seriously worthwhile. Not that it just so, that it does something, but it does something really worthwhile. Because there's more than a hundred vaccines being developed now, so it may well be that you know some of them are going to. Um, you know, I, I very much hope that some of them will be effective. But politics will intervene. It's, it's in Donald Trump's interest to announce a vaccine before November the 3rd. Sure, sure. I mean, yeah, that's going to happen. But, um, but there, there are some good, there are some very promising vaccines out there. And let's, I mean, really, let's hope that we can get avalanche randomization, get properly randomized evidence and get things that really work to be the things that are deployed. Because at the moment, the Indians are suffering something like 75,000 new cases per day. And, you, you know, with, and there, there just aren't healthcare facilities. You know, they, they just can't be helped many, in many of them. You just let them take their luck. I mean, OK, India, on average, is younger than this country. And the risk goes down quite steeply with age. But nevertheless, there's going to be a lot of suffering and a lot of death. You've done a massive piece of work for WHO, haven't you, on international comparisons of treatments. Is that, have any results come out of that yet? Well, the results will come out. What they've done, so what it's done so far, what's been announced so far, is really confirmation of what the Oxford study showed, which is that hydroxychloroquine and lopinavir really are of no material value, that they just don't save lives. The hope was, back in February, March, that these old antivirals, which are anti, you know, which have, uh, which have an antiviral effect, in vitro, or in the case of lapinavir against HIV, that they might be useful in terms of saving lives of patients who are in hospital 
with COVID and basically the trials, you know, most famously the Oxford trial, but also the WHO trial has confirmed this, although the results have just been described online. But it, but th th these things aren't of any material value. So I think at the moment, the only thing that's really been shown to be of material value in terms of saving lives is dexamethasone or possibly other steroids. I think maybe one should just say steroids in general, though those steroids do reduce the extent to which you kill yourself by having your own immune system attacking your lungs and the rest of you. Now, our Prime Minister says that uh, Britain has been world beaten. Where are we in the league table of, of deaths in terms of percentage of population? Well, other countries wouldn't be counting deaths the way I am. So you, you've got to have comparable counting. I mean, you know, it, there's no point comparing somebody saying 42,000 or 43,000, me saying 75,000, when we know that we're using different methods. I mean, if you, if you look, if you use these historical comparisons to look at numbers of deaths, then, okay, some of the European countries would be among the worst. But then you've also got to, it, it really makes a difference how many old people you've got. In a country where you've got relatively few old people, if you have the same death rate at each age, if two countries have the same death rates at each age, but one country's got a lot more old people, then the country with a lot more old people is going to be the one that, um, that finishes up with the higher death rate. And this is why I say that I don't think that the total crude number of deaths, or even the crude number of deaths per million, is a good statistic. It's not good for comparing countries. So where are we in, in, in any comparison in the world in the world table of deaths? Well, not good. I mean, all the European, well, I mean, European countries in general um, got hit pretty hard. I mean, we've got aging populations, and um, we, we, and yeah, I mean, sure, things could have been done better, but uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't think it's helpful in terms of working out how to go forward to try and work out what the government should or should not have done in January, February or March, I really don't think it's helpful. I don't think it'll help them going forward. And I don't think it'll help anybody who you want to try and protect. I mean, the question is, what do we do from now? Now, is there now herd immunity, do you think, in the UK? No. Why not? Because we haven't had enough people infected to produce herd immunity. At what point will there be herd immunity? When well, I mean, we've had a few percent infected and more than 90% not infected. So more than 90% of people are still at risk. You're not on SAGE, are you? No. no. I mean, if you were on SAGE, what do you, would you be advising the government now to do? Oh, God knows, actually. I mean, you, you can't keep the country locked down forever. I mean, look, look at the damage that the depressions of the... 90, the depression of the 1920s in Britain and the 1930s, the rest of the world, did to humanity. I mean, the, these, and look, look at the damage that even was done by the relatively mild economic crash in 2008. I mean, we've already got an economic crash bigger than that. And what that's going to do to the quality of society, I don't know. I mean, what should the government do? What do you, what, it, it, it's, I mean, I guess it's, it, I, I don't know what the government should do. If I were Prime Minister, I don't know what I would do. To what extent should one prioritise trying to reopen things? And to what extent should one prioritise trying to protect against spread of the virus? I mean, there's only so much consent you can get. I mean, there was, there was consent to the initial lockdown. But if you really tried to do another lockdown like that again, you wouldn't have general public political consent to it. I mean, you, you know, governments don't go so far beyond what the population will accept. In the health versus wealth um, equation, which should, which should predominate? Well, it depends what you're going to do. I mean, if you if you really get social breakdown, social breakdown is not funny. I don't. I mean, if you're actually a humanitarian, if you, I don't know what what should be done. I, mean, I, re I, I do not know what is what is actually appropriate. I mean, I'll try and get the statistics and we'll try and find out which vaccines work and we'll try and find out which medicines work. And you've then got to have a political process to decide what you do with the information you've got about the ability of the disease to spread and so on. And I think I'd like to start off with reasonably accurate information on that and when, when that's being discussed. But I, I don't know. It's I don't think it's any one person to to say. 
I don't know what I would do if I were Prime Minister. I don't know how I would balance these competing real, serious human value interests. You know, lo loads of people losing their jobs really makes a difference to the quality of life and to, to all sorts of things. I mean, quality of life, to life expect whatever you like. Would you say it's not obvious. Have been spooked a bit? And maybe should. I'm sorry. Have people been spooked by COVID a bit too much? Should they relax a bit more? Should they relax a bit more? I don't think I'd say at all what people should do. I mean, when we've done our studies on smoking, I can show that more than half of all smokers will be killed by it if they keep smoking. I can show that stopping smoking works. But that's not the same as saying that people should stop. I think in that case, I think it's rather easier I mean, I think by putting prices up, by having plain packaging, by not having tobacco promotion and so on, and trying to emphasise that this is the big serious killer compared with other things, you know, I think I, I think that that's not such a big um, detriment to the quality of life. So I think that the the fact that the rich on the whole in this country have stopped smoking, professionals don't smoke now, as back in the nineteen sixties they would have done. Um, I don't think that that's really much of a loss of quality of life. But I mean, if you get really widespread unemployment and massive economic recession, it really is a big change in the quality of life. I think we haven't taken smoking appropriately seriously. How seriously we should take COVID, I do not know. I don't, I do not know. I mean, again, I'd like to know how many of these deaths were deaths of people who really had a good quality of life. You know, certainly a, a fair number of them were, but probably a minority. If, and at the same time, in this country, we've got 100,000 deaths a year from tobacco. If Boris Johnson were to walk into your, your house in Jericho, knock on the front door and say, Sir Richard, give me advice. What should I do? Um, well, I wouldn't bother because he wouldn't listen to me, I don't suppose. <laughs> um, I don't think that the statisticians who put the numbers together should have more opinion, more weight than lots of other people in trying to decide what to do. I would like accurate statistics, but I'd, I'd like better statistics on, you know, who is losing a lot, who, which people are really dying, who have a lot left to live for. And I, I don't mean only, you know, people who are under 70. It's actually, if you do surveys of you know, how much people are enjoying life, and you look at people in their, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, if, if people are in good health in their 70s, they actually get more satisfaction. It's probably because we've got houses and the kids have just got rent, they're just renting. One way or another, people in their 70s actually can have a, a very good quality of life. And, you know, speaking from the inside, life from inside being in my 70s isn't so greatly different from life in my 50s, life in my 30s. Um, but I think life among, for people in their 90s almost entirely it's not easy. Nobody in their nineties has got a good quality of life, but you know nothing like. Whereas, still in your seventies, you can have a very good, very good quality of life and enjoy things. So, I'm, I don't, I'm not saying the deaths of the people in their seventies or eighties, whatever, don't matter. But there is a difference, and I think one has to take that. So again, the same thing with traffic accidents. What should one do to reduce the risk of traffic accidents or industrial accidents? And you know what what. You know, how much should one spend on health in balance with education or with various other things? I, I don't know. I, I think these are political choices. And I think what I'd like to do would be to try to get the statistics straight so that, you know, the body politic could actually take seriously what, what the situation is and try and come to those choices. I don't, my, I'd like my input to be to get the numbers straight. We're coming towards the, the political end. process, but I'd like to have the political process without, without very biased news sites. I mean, I don't know. I mean, the political process now with um, with you know internet manipulation and with deliberately partisan right wing me media sites. So, you know, I don't want partisan left wing media sites or partisan right wing media sites. I quite like some sort of objectivity. You know, bring back George Orwell. Now, the, the, the vast majority of us will not get, get COVID-19. If we do, it'll be quite mild and we probably will not be admitted to hospital and increasingly less into intensive care. Is that how, how the stats are going? 
Um, well, if we get a big increase in, you know, if I'm, I suppose that, you know, going back to university, back to school, I mean, it's not going to kill the pupils and it's not going to kill the university students, but it might really finish up spreading the disease um, and then it'll spread it to, to older people and the older people will, you know, some of them really will finish up seriously ill and dying. I don't, I don't know how, I mean, it's really gone, it's really going back, back up fast in Spain now. And in France, in France, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, last week, they had 5,000 new cases, 6,000 new cases and 7,000 new cases, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I mean, this is really explosive. And, they, and, and it's limited in, in geographic spread as well. It's mainly um, Paris, Marseille and Nice. You know, th th it could happen. It could really come bombing back. And we haven't, we haven't really got much protection against it. I mean, all we've got is, is, is social distancing. I mean, we, yeah, we've got somewhat better treatment, but, you know, we, we, you know how could you run the underground, London Underground the way it was six months ago? You just can't run you just can't run society like that with a bug like this around. I don't know, I don't know what to do. I really don't know what should be done socially. So until there's a working vaccine, we really can't relax. Working vaccine and working drugs and, and get get vaccinated. Yeah, you, you want to try and keep it down so that those who get infected on average infect fewer than one new, one other person. And I don't see any guarantee that that's the case at the moment. I think maybe, I mean, the trouble is there's, there's just so many jobs involved. I mean, maybe pubs and so on really need you know, very strong constraints on, um, on how they operate. You know, I don't know how social distancing can work in pubs. And, you know, just pubs, restaurants, just places like that. But this in involves a huge amount of employment. You know, so many people have their jobs dependent on restaurants, on pubs, on, on general entertainment and, you know, theatres, cinemas. I mean, they're... they're, they're um, I mean, I, I, I would like to get back to where we were. I think possibly that much more widespread testing could make a huge could make a huge difference if we could get testing so that it's really practicable. And they, they've got now. I mean, just recently, the US approved the Abbott lateral flow te test, which is a bit like a pregnancy test, where you can actually get a result within a few minutes. And you can also you could also imagine testing machinery which is just much more convenient you know if you could have just a spit sample that was tested either by a lateral flow test like a pregnancy test or by some machine that'll spit out a result within an hour or two which is you know i think things like this are technically feasible then perhaps you could get to the point where schools and universities and you know various other venues are practicable if you could actually get tests with a quick readout i mean it's it's that you know, I think maybe some sort of technical fi fixes like that have been underemphasized in in the search for vaccines and drugs. I mean, I've I've done my work mainly on vaccines and drugs. You know, trying to help people who are trying to study va vaccines and drugs. But maybe actually getting the logistics of really really simple widespread testing does offer a way for society to escape from this without mass unemployment. In mass unemployment, the road to Wigan, you read the road to Wigan Pier, you know, it's not a society that you want. You don't want not, to 9.3 million, million, on, million people are on furlough, you know, which comes to the end, the end, end of October. I didn't hear you, sorry. 9.3 million of people are being paid by the government on furlough. That comes to the end the end of October. What happens then? Yeah, and it's it's not sustainable, is it? It isn't sustainable. You know, it's... That all this um, this unemployment isn't sustainable. I mean, they've tried, uh, you know, they're going to have to try to do something other than the standard austerity measures. And I think I think they realise that. Um, very, very last question from from me, Richard. Are you are you depressed or not about the immediate future? Well, um, ask me in November. Ask I mean, you in November. See, there's always there's always things that are, you know, fairly depressing about the about the world, you know, if you actually know what's really happening, there's all sorts of things that are wrong. But at the other hand, I mean, the number of people who've got a quality of life that was just sort of unimaginable 150 years ago is, you know, it is, it is remarkable. I mean, we've, you know, 
I think my quality of life is, I'm sure, is a lot better than that of Luke Atour's. You know, even if he did have five different chefs and so on cooking for him, it's, um, I'd, I think that we, we forget how bad the past was. Your know, description of human life is nasty, brutish and short, you know, so we're so far away from that. We worry about things other than that. I mean, it, is, is, this the worst, is this the worst pandemic the world has had, worse than Spanish flu? Oh. What, since Spanish flu? Well, what does one say about malaria? I mean, malaria is 10,000 deaths a week still. And, you know, the good news is it used to be 30,000 deaths a week back in the 1990s. And there's um, the overall death rates around the world have gone down a lot over the last few decades. And this, even if it's several million deaths, is, is not is not the worst that's happened. I mean, you know, every year you've got, you know, you've, you've been having a few million deaths from TB. You've been having, you know, the number of child deaths is, is just down so far compared with what it was in 1970. Um, but yeah, it's, it's bad. And, you know, if you're in the middle of a place where things are really bad, then it is really bad. And there are a number of places where it's got better because of lockdowns and various social distancing measures, but there's a number of places in the world where it's really, it's really got worse and it's getting worse. In New South America, and you know where it's just really rising out of control, unfortunately. But no, it's not. Yes, it's, so, so you're not tra planning to travel to Brazil in the near future. I'm not travelling anywhere. I'll sort of. It's amazing. You can do an amazing amount by. Um, by, from your computer screen. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, uh, any, any, any last message for, as a scientist to the to, to people watching this about, about the pandemic? Yes, I think just try to keep a... You, we need accurate numbers of the number of premature deaths that this is causing. And we need... Um, we need comparisons with other problems. At the moment, this is, you know, I don't know, just in some, some sort of perspective. But I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not saying have a perspective that, you know, 25 million cases that have been diagnosed and, you know, I'm sure there'd be more people infected and, you know, maybe a million deaths that are known of. And I'm sure there'd been more than that, as, as the statistics I showed just illustrates, you know, do, do these things matter? Yes. Are they the worst things that ever happened? No. You know, Think of it as a percentage of the Second World War. And this is the last, last question. You share a building with a vaccine team at Oxford University. Is there white smoke coming out of the, the, the fireplaces? Oh, nobody knows the results of these trials. I mean, it, it, I think, I think it, I think, I hope that some of these vaccines, there are more than 100 vaccines in development. Some of them really look good. There's lots of qualitatively different ones. I think we just should set about, we should be testing, testing, te you know, testing these vaccines really massively, randomizing hundreds of thousands of people, you know, randomizing a few tens of thousands for each promising vaccine versus control. I think the costs of widespread randomization of vaccines are a small fraction of, us, of the other costs of the pandemic. And we'll just get really clean answers, really clear answers, which will allow us to um, really move forward. And let's hope that one of them or some of them really work. It's a very reasonable hope. Okay. Same Thank you very much. Treatments. Very, very open with us. Um, uh, you, you mentioned my book, and it is my book, uh, on the pandemic, it's my, my edited book. Uh, Richard did not contribute to this book, nor, nor does he endorse it. This is a collection of essays on the pandemic and where we went wrong, 20 or so people, some of them positive, some not so positive about the government on this. It's available on Amazon, do buy it. It's a, it's a good read, if I say so myself. Meanwhile, moving on to next week. Next week, we have another well-known uh, Jericho resident, uh, Andrew Graham, the former uh, master of Balliol, talking on why we should keep the BBC and how good it is for us. There's going to be uh, the mother of a battle over the BBC in the winter. Um, uh, we, I will contribute to that, as will other people. And then on the 10th of September, Jim White, uh, again, another local <laughs> Jericho resident, uh, writes the Daily Telegraph on um, his sporting, he's a writer for the Daily Telegraph, a very good writer, the Daily Telegraph. If you want to uh, 
come to any of those, just register on Eventbrite and watch on YouTube. But meanwhile, let's go back to some of the millions of pounds which the government has spent on advertising uh, during the pandemic. Millions and millions and millions of pounds. Let's see what they're saying at the moment. We used to stand side by side. We used to stand without divide. Who would have thought we'd end up on our knees? Let's get back to where we used to be. We used to love with open arms, without question, without a law. Now someone's locked the door, threw away the key. Let's get back. Testing is free, quick and vital to stop the spread of coronavirus. So let's get tested and get back to the things we love. We used to 